My name is uh, Jennifer Don Bishop. I'm the artistic director for the Gordon Tatusis Niganiwan Theatre. And I am Marcel Petit. I am currently the Circle Voices coordinator for the 2017-2018 Circle Voices. Tell me about your program. What is it called? What's the age group or target audience and the aim of the program? Um, well, we target uh, youth from ages 15, 16 to well, 24, 25. Nice. You know, so high school to post-secondary. Uh, and it's called the Circle of Voices program. It incorporates themes of cultural identity, intergenerational impacts of residential schools and family, and as well as the arts. Uh, what is the program intended to do? What are the learning objectives? Well, the, the COV invites up to about 15 uh, participants in the program each year. And, you know, there's about eight or ten that graduate from it, but uh, the youth are immersed in a learning environment of theater, cultural, career development, and it's delivered over 24 weeks from October to March, and it's an after-school program that runs uh, five to nine, two to three days a week, and as they get closer to their own production based on their theme, then it climbs up to four days and more if needed, especially when you uh, add in technical time and uh, rehearsals and all the fun facts of theater. Mm -hmm. Feel free to jump in. Yeah, I think, it, and I think from from what she said, the the biggest thing that we we do is we, because and if you look at if you look at Jennifer and because she was one of the very first ones, right, and where she is now as the artistic director, is that we try to help them push themselves mm -hmm. uh, out of their boundaries because they they have confidence, they have self esteem, they have all those things inside of them. It's just what we try to do is help them push themselves out of their own little safety zones, right? Because a lot of these youth come in with their, they're very quiet, they're very introvert, they're very scared, they're very insecure. But by the time the program's over, most of them and all of them, I'm not saying it works with every one of them, are acting on stage and they're doing something on stage. They're being more talkative. They're, they're actually walking up to people and saying hi rather than just standing in the corner. So it's really just about growth, trying to change patterns to break them out of their shell a little. Because I think when we, when and I and I'm going to say this from the beginning, when I first started this, I think one of the biggest problems we had is that we figured out is that, I think a lot of people were coming into the circle of voices going, I'm going to become this huge actor and I'm going to get all <laughs> these parts and it's going to work right, mm -hmm. and and I don't think that's what we are actually. We help you take the next step and we're not here to go. Okay, as soon as you take this for six months, Hollywood's going to be calling you or or somebody in Winnipeg or Calgary right and now you're right. going to get it. You might, you might get lucky, mm -hmm. um, but those are few and few and far, right? So basically, what we're we're hope to help is that we're hopefully helping by going, let's break you out of your shell, let's give you some culture, because a lot of these kids come in still. We we still had at the interviews, we had kids coming in. I don't want to learn about my culture. Yeah, and that's and that's and that was me at my at that age too, right? So it's trying to make them understand we're not going to force this stuff on you. But bring them a little into it, right, to make them understand this is part of them. Because we all know that unless we find out where we're from, we're never really going to be anywhere, right? And that's a big step. I'm not saying you have to walk around with a Métis sash on after you know you're Métis or that you have to do certain things when you're, you, you become Indigenous. But figure out where you're from and find out where you're from. And, and, if, and it might touch them somehow, that it'll wake something up in them that they'll help move let's say, help move themselves or other people. Okay. You look at people like Jennifer and even 20 other Circle Voice XCOV that used to be. They're doing something now, right? Yeah. They were part of that beginning that they're doing something now, but they're showing that they can move on, right? And, and that's, a, that's a big thing. If you look at it on paper and if you look at it from back in the back, you don't really see it, but when you start seeing the COV that are around us and how many there are, and that they're either going to school or they're, they're educators or they're artistic directors or they're direct writing or actors themselves. There's a lot of them around. And, um, and it's, it's strange to see that, I, that you notice that after a while. I was never, I wish I could have been one, mm -hmm. but, but I'm too old. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it happened way after me. Uh -huh. um, but um, but it, it's an amazing experience, right? It's a, it's a, it's a life-changing thing. It's, that's a big thing that I think Jennifer knows and we've also told, told the youth is that you may not get it now, you may never get it ever, mm -hmm. 
but in 10 years or 15 years, you're going to look back and go, oh, I get it now, right? And I think that's what we're trying to do, is make them understand that it's worth it. It may not seem like it right now, but if you come for, and it, it's a lot different from when Jennifer used to do it oh, compared yes. to now, right? <laughs> it was a year-long thing, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, and, back then, for yeah. me, it was only, because it was first starting out, oh, it yeah. was only three months long. That's right. Oh, wow. And then 2003, it was a whole year. Yeah, yeah, when yeah. it started to grow, when the program started yeah. expanding, we were able to like have it for longer days, more extended time. And they got paid. And they got paid, so mm -hmm. it led into a paid program. Yeah. Um, but, and like we could tell you what like COV can do for you, but sometimes you end up finding other things that come out of you that you get from that program. Mm -hmm. And we could tell you, you know, this is what it can do for you. But then when you go through the program, you discover it did other things for you oh, in yeah. different ways. and. I think with this particular program, it really helps you find that voice or, you know, to keep the, you know, remove the cage from that, that voice because everyone comes from different yeah. backgrounds. Mm -hmm. As he mentioned, I grew up with no cultural identity. I grew up with like bullying in my background and, you know, for a program like this had like saved me and it, you know, gave me something to look forward to to fight for and even for other people that not necessarily continue their fields into the arts after taking COV, they still come and they thank us because we gave them that confidence and boosters and the life experience for them to move forward mm -hmm. into their dream with, with confidence. Yeah. And so And just like asking those questions and finding out this is my identity as I move forward doing what I want to do. Exactly. And it's and then and a, a, the big the other big thing is the friendships, right? Is that they they're the friendships that you gain, but then it's uh, I hate using that word that family thing, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to so don't even <laughs> don't even listen to that. All right. Um, but it's it's really what they do to each other, and what cause and effect happens to to themselves, because they see themselves differently. They look at you. They're able to make fools of themselves on stage, mm -hmm. right? And they're able to make fun of themselves without ending up bullying. And they're able to just be themselves for those three or four hours a night that they're sitting with us. And that's big. And you notice the ones that fall off at the beginning, right? When you start off with 15 and you, you end up with 10 or 8, the ones, and the, the ones that leave aren't, just aren't ready for this just yet, right? Which is not, there's nothing wrong with that but hopefully next year or the year after that they're going to be ready to kind of break out of that shell. And some may never, but it's, it's big. It's, it's, you, you think about it, because when I first started in 2003, the first time I did the, the, the coordinating, it was interesting to see what these kids were like and what mm -hmm. these youth were like, right? And how they broke out and where some of them are now. And you go, wow, good for you. I do admit it's, it's a big commitment. It's mm -hmm. like three or, four, three or four hours a night, mm -hmm. not getting paid, and, and I'm coming to do this, why? It's six months long. And six months know? long. And, and being a young person, right? Being 18, 19 years old, mm -hmm. I probably have better things to do. But you're showing up. And that's the biggest thing. And, yeah. that's, and that's the thing I don't think they get, is that one day they'll go, I stayed with this for six months, for three hours a night, and had to listen to Marcel. <laughs> that's a huge commitment. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to think back on that, that's hopefully one day they'll get it. They'll go, that's a long time. And it doesn't seem like it, but it is. It's a long time. Yeah. It, helped, uh, it helped to build up like with balancing things too because, you know, not all of our, uh, our different p participants, some are like single parents mm -hmm. or are working a part-time job and going to school and, you know, still having that drive to try to fit circle of voices into their life and you know and it's it's definitely something that's not easy but mm -hmm. surprising for those who still continue to work to try to make that happen yeah. and we do what we can to to accommodate so we don't absolutely just like shut someone out just mm -hmm. because of these reasons we'll reach out with whatever we can do to accommodate to the best of our advantage to yeah. help these oh, yeah. students out whether they're homeless or they have addictions or they're mm -hmm. going through problem, um, financial problems we we make sure that we make sure that we're we're trustworthy enough that they can come up to us and say, "Hey Marcel, hey Jennifer, I'm going through this stuff. Can you help me?" Mm -hmm. For instance, this past this 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 COV now we had we had a, a young woman who who needed a home a place to go, and she came to us right, and we helped to get out of a certain situation and find a place. 
because of what she was still going through, she didn't fit, she, she didn't last in the program, but at least she's looking after herself still. Mm -hmm. We gave her that help to help herself, mm -hmm. and that was big, and, and, that's, and that's a huge thing. If somebody comes up to you and says, help, because that's one of the hardest things a human being can ever do, right? Yeah. Because our egos get in the way, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we don't want to ask for help, but if somebody can come ask help, we're doing something right. Because some, some of these kids, and not all of them, because again, it's changed a little from from 10 years ago and stuff like that, is that before it used to be kids that are coming from complete crap, crap, right? And some of these kids are still marginalized, and some of these kids have to deal with racism every single day. Mm -hmm. But uh, some, of the, some of the kids that are still in COV still have really crappy, crappy lives. But it's not up to me to kind of, I'm putting you on my shoulder, but what it's up to me is to build that relationship with them and say, we're here to help you, but you need to ask us. Because right. some come in very grouchy still, and they, they want to be angry, right? But explaining to them that we don't know what your day was like. We don't know how you're feeling. We don't know that you had this happen or this happen. But you don't know if something happened to us either, right? Mm. But we're not going to walk into, I'm not going to walk into the circle of voices going rah, 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 and be mad at everybody, right? Because of my day. I still have to be a certain person. Mm. Without overacting and, and hiding what I'm going through, but making sure I don't bring that, that kind of energy to what we're doing. Yeah. And so a lot of them now are talking to us. We, that's why we have the circle at the beginning. We smudge. We, we have a prayer. How was your day? And you can say anything you wanted that day because it's a safe place, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, a, that's a huge environment to start off with, with that smell, the prayer, and going, tell me how your day was. And at the beginning, a lot of them would just say, I had a good day. And that was it, right? But now we're getting in everybody talking. Everybody's actually telling us how their day was instead of just good. Yeah. Right? I need more than good. I think that's one of the worst words in the whole, my, the whole history of the human language is, how's your day? Good. good. How are you? <laughs> good. Right? So making them change that. Yeah. Right? And, and that's big. And you see that now. And you, you have, we have right now, we have eight amazing young people that are forming a nice group. We've also made sure that, and, and this is, and, and I'll say for me, what I really wanted to do is make them understand this is up to them. I'm, yes, I'm the one controlling this stuff, and I'm kind of, let's say, the boss. But I want you guys to make sure that you understand that it's yours, right? Mm -hmm. So, let's say Jennifer was falling down a little, and she's not showing up. I want you guys to do something about it, rather than me. Go up to them and say, hey, how can I help you? What's going on? You're, you're not pulling your weight. Mm -hmm. Because I want you to be that knit group, right? Because I could be the beam guy and go, rah, 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 right? Which I would never be. But rather than me do it, you do it. Because you guys know with each other what you're going to, right? You, you have your group. And so it works. And we've already had a few talk to each other. Where they've said, what are you doing? How come you're not showing up? And then they come back to me, well, we talk to them, da-da-da. Go on. So they're taking that initiative to try and make sure they work together. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So you guys have sort of answered this question, but like, how do you measure the success of your program? It's, uh, it's, it's actually quite different. I mean, I find it a big success, the fact that we're still here. Mm -hmm. You know, like COV started back up in 1999. Wow. That was almost 20 years ago, and I was in that first program. I was 13 in that that program, so uh, it's been a while since we've taken anyone mm -hmm. that young, but yeah. just mm -hmm. it goes to show that it's now 2018, and we're running our 2017-18 Circle of Voices program you know, speaks uh, volumes on how important it is to to the community yeah. and to everyone that we encounter and the participants that uh, finish the program, even if it's not like a giant number, it's mm -hmm. still an impactful number for these for yeah. these young students. And we've had well over a hundred students that have completed this program. Exactly. So, you know, for me, the biggest su success is the fact that we're still here today. Yeah, I, I think that's a big thing when you look at the, the people that we serve and the participants that we, we've, we've looked after since 1999, is that when those, wa those words qualitative and quantitative came in, into, and people wanted answers right now, right? And give us answers. How are, how are these kids doing? What's, mm -hmm. what's the success? Yeah. Is that you can't, we can't use that because we, we may not see some of the success of any of these kids for 10 or 15 years. And so for me to sit there and say, 
it's now a success because of this one person doing doing something. It really doesn't show the truth behind it. Mm -hmm. What the success is is what Jennifer just said. We're still here since 1999. Yeah, we've changed mm -hmm. and it's gone up and down, and the kids have changed every year. But they'll, it's almost the same stories from every one of the kids. I we bet I bet we can go throughout year after year, and every youth that's come here probably has the same story but at a different time. So our success really isn't about numbers, about how many kids are finishing right now, or even how many plays we've done. I think it is, it's like she said, it's 1999, it's 2018. It's 17 years later, we're still here, and it's yeah. still working. It's amazing. Yeah. We still get visits from our past COV alum mm -hmm. from different years. Even if you weren't in the same year, you somehow become buddies with uh, the ones that were previous, or they want to meet the new ones, mm -hmm. and you know, Sometimes it's not it. It's a never-ending circle for some because they are continuing themselves in the theater realm, and we hire them back, the ones that have really shown the commitment and they mm -hmm. want to continue learning. Mm -hmm. So we've had COB that come back as our mentee artist program where they come back working publicity, designing posters, right. stage managing the shows. And so it's just like never ending. Half of our office was a uh, COV alum or parents of COV or people that just ran COV for mm -hmm. several exactly. years. <laughs> it's, it's funny because it's, it's weird that I've never been a COV, but I felt, I feel like one because I'll be honest with you, when I first started this job in 2003, it was the start of my own journey. It was my journey becoming an artist again because I didn't think I had a right to be an artist my whole life because I was just, I was a half-breed Métis guy, right? Mm from the foster homes and broken families. And so when I got here, this was the place that opened me up. Without, without GTNT or an SNT, Saskatchewan Native Theatre, when it was called back then, yeah. I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't have made four documentaries and 50 other movies. I wouldn't be acting and writing. and I wouldn't have written my, own, my first play without this place. And so I owe a lot to it. But I also owe a lot to the young people because without those young people, I wouldn't have figured out me a little bit more going, oh, I get why I was such a crappy kid when I was a kid, youth, because look at that. Mm -hmm. So these kids helped me with my own healing because I started seeing me in a lot of them without sounding an ego and it's like it's all about me. Right. But I started noticing going, oh, I used to be like that. Oh, I get it now. And so I get a lot of the things that they're going through because I went through those things. And I'm going, oh, I see it. So this place was big for me. And the closest I think I ever become becoming a COV was they had one of their um, one of their very sh first shows at my dad's boxing club, and which always makes second me laugh. Second show, actually. Second show. That was the second year yeah. COV man. <laughs> and so that was cool, and and so that was my closest, and that's when I first met Donna and Kenich. I didn't really talk to a lot of the people. I, Curtis Curtis, who was there, was I, I knew of him, and I knew of a few of the other people, but it was. It wasn't until, wow, what, almost six years later yeah. until, until I got back into it. And it was all because of one wrong mistake of an email. I sent the wrong email to the wrong person, mm. and I got a job. Wow. And so it, it, was, it was a good, it was a, there was a reasons why. We always talk about synchronicity and stuff like that, right? And there, that proved it right there, me sending the wrong email to somebody and going, hey, do you want a job? And I took it. And it changed my life, and here I am now. And it's and it's so it's really strange that I've always. I would have loved to have done this when I was a kid, but I have a feeling if I would have tried this to do this when I was 17, 18 years old, I probably would have been the one of the very first left. I would have left too. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have lasted, mm -hmm. because I was too angry, and I would have just like, oh, screw you guys, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. This is stupid, right? And I would have walked out. So I'm I'm glad I I became a COV without actually being a COV because I went through the training, I watched the acting, I did the, the combat, the, the stage combat, I did the vocal stuff, I did the movement and the dance with them and it helped me. Mm -hmm. It helped me along the way and um, we'll never talk about my first acting gig ever again. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but now I've, I've acted now in three different planes, right? Yeah. And I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been that person without this place, and and I think that's a big thing with a lot of the COV is that I bet a lot of them, I'm going to say at least 98 percent of them will look back and go, someplace in their life they're going to say I wouldn't be here unless I would have done this right, and that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Which is pretty much me today, starting out the program yeah. at 13, and now I'm yeah. 32 and artistic director. I never thought I'd be artistic director someday, mm -hmm. yeah. but, yeah. you know, that the program impacted so much for me that I'm still here, and I want to do the same and reach out to other students, help them oh, yeah. find their voice. It's big, right? It's like you look at who's around us. You, you've got Corey and Danny and Curtis and Jennifer and Aaron and... Seamus. Oh, Seamus. you got all these people. Who are doing amazing things? Yeah, was it was it because of COV? I'm going to say yes, partly. The majority of it was them, mm -hmm. but this this place I think kicked them in the ass a little. Going, oh, I get it, I get it, and um, and it's 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 an amazing amazing program for young people. It's amazing when you bring them back to that some that apply for the artist mentorship, which is like a step up, a more of that leadership role. Mm -hmm. And then when they're working with the new batch of COV, they get why we would like, you know, scold them for being late or for doing this. And they're like, oh, okay, I know why you did that. And now I have to do that. I'm totally seeing it. Because sometimes, like you said, might not kick in till later. So mm, yeah. it's, it, it, it's funny uh, to kind of like see that realization on them. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> cool. We don't, we never want to believe what adults say when we're 15, 16, right? Yeah, exactly. We don't want to believe that crap. And then you, when you finally get it, God, God it. <laughs> Mom and Dad were right. That teacher was right. <laughs> yeah. So, like, what, in your opinion, makes it a, an example of excellence in Indigenous education? I think it's just the way we teach it. I'm going we to say don't it the way. Force. Yeah, that's the word. We don't force it, but we teach it differently. With adding culture and adding the arts, mm -hmm. and adding their voice, even mm -hmm. their voice into it, it, we really make sure it doesn't come from us. We make sure it comes from them. And that's a big thing, even with the with the script writing. Like you, you look at you look at before a lot of the scripts were written by them, so they learn how to write scripts. They learn how to talk. They learn how to do dialogue. They learn how to literacies right there, right? They, mm -hmm. And you, we've met a lot. I've met a lot of kids in this program that that are 17, 16 years old and don't know how to read, and that screws you up. That we're in the middle of Saskatchewan in a, in this country, mm -hmm. and you and there's kids that don't know how to read still. And no disrespect to them, but I think that's what it is, is mixing that culture, mixing their voice, and not forcing it is really a really big issue. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I think and I still believe that as First Nations, Indigenous people, we don't learn the same way. And I think putting 30 of us under fluorescent lights in front of one teacher is not the way we're used to doing it. And, and I think that's where we're failing a lot of kids, is because we're saying math for, for two hours and then English for two hours, mm -hmm. right? Rather than being, do it on the land, do it outside, give us couches so we can learn that way. That's the way we learn. And more than one person that's uh, leading it through. Yeah. So, yes, we have our one person there to be the coordinator guide, mm -hmm. but we bring in all sorts of different perspectives because everyone's different and yeah. they might adapt to something that works for them the best. So it's not just one person, for example, bringing them in on stage combat. We bring in different people, mm -hmm. you know, and it's really great for, to expose them and getting them to know, you know, who else is out there and to act as these mm -hmm. mentors. Because, yeah, you, you look at, like, even this year, I can take a think about it, is that one instance, and I'm not the greatest actor in the world, but I, I helped them with their monologues. I helped them with their stuff and how, how I've learned. And then we had um, Frank, who was a tech guy, but a very good, he's, he's knowledgeable at theater and acting because he's been around it for a long time, and mm -hmm. he's also, he's, he's, he's trained in, cl in clowning, I guess. And, wow. and, and so he knows what he's doing. So he taught them as well on stage during the monologues and then he's they've got Curtis mm -hmm. who's taught him stuff and then different other other a few other people and now the new director who's going to be coming to teach him will have a different way of doing things and so we make sure at the beginning we tell him take what you need from everybody don't believe this is the truth right this is the way you have to do it take what you need from it and use it for your own and so because when they get to Daniel it's going to be different from what Curtis is from, from myself and maybe Jennifer or anybody else. But if they can use that, so that teaching is really helps them. As, as Jennifer said, it opens their mind to all these different things, and that's huge. And that's and that's big when you when you look back and go, you've just not paid for, and and given for free for six months, four or five different acting classes by four or five different people. Mm -hmm. who may not be right, but at all different levels of acting and f come from all different perspectives. 
And that's big, because if you were to try and pay for that out of there, you probably wouldn't pay for five different people to teach you acting. You probably would have went to one acting school and that's it. And that's all you'd learn. And I think that's what, that's a big thing is that I think another thing that we try to teach them through that education is that don't stick with one. Don't stick with one person and going, this is the right person to learn acting from. And that's the thing that we try and tell them. Go watch theater. Watch movies. Watch theater. Watch movies. Watch the way people act and mm -hmm. see what it's like. And even to the simple thing is body movement and learning how to use your body. Because I'm a big guy. So when I'm on stage, I know I don't have to go, because I'm already there. Mm -hmm. People are going to see me. And if you put Jennifer beside me, teaching them understanding that is that when we're beside each other, people are still going to look at me. So how can she, without being too extraordinary, how does she move and how do I help her and stuff like that? It's, mm -hmm. So it's kind of sharing. And I think, I think that's one thing I learned a long time ago is that is how actors feed off of each other to complement each other because we're not there to better each other, but mm -hmm. what we're there to do is complement each other when we're on that stage and save each other too, right? When we forget lines or, or yeah. we're about to laugh going and we can look at each other and go, don't you fucking laugh. <laughs> come on, come on, there it is. And so I think that's the thing that we teach them too is that, that ability to, to start thinking. It's that, it's that um, what do you call it? is a word for it is it's really trying to figure things out before it happens because theater and acting is a, is a strange fun place to be but it's when it comes to live theater I love it because I always wait for something to go wrong mm -hmm. I, sometimes I want things to go wrong just to see what will happen and especially with the actor it's like what's going to happen it's fun when they laugh now and then you can actually see them breaking down out of character for you a few seconds because you know oh, this is so stupid but then get right back into it and I think, you know, like with as far as indigenous and like the arts, you know, I would have loved to have, uh, I'm glad that my first exposure to this kind of learning experience was through the COB program. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, of, the, of what I learned and loved from this program, and then of course, you know, something like this isn't in the, the classroom mm -hmm. when you move on to another school. Um, and you take other drama because you still want to follow in that arts and it's a different environment mm -hmm. yeah. you know and this one it just it has that they bring out that comfort and compassion and they really em embrace you regardless of what you're going through mm -hmm. you know because they're there to, to help you you know not necessarily give you all the answers but yeah. help give you those tools there's a more personalization uh, with it they really care about each they get to know each and every individual in, in the program mm -hmm. and doing that work one-on-one -on -one or there's questions uh, on the culture aspect of it to confine it into this one class mm -hmm. you know i would love to have this like in the school so there is a difference uh, especially with our approach into mm -hmm. arts and culture than to other schools and how they approach them and i'm not speaking ill will because you can learn a lot from that but yeah. you could definitely tell a difference when you're someone taking a program like this and then a program that's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what is indigenous education? Like, how do you define the word indigenous? Is it a, is it a term that you would normally use? I don't think it's a term I'd normally use. I, I, I wouldn't say it indigenous. If I, would, if I would have to say anything about indigenous education, I look at something like St. Francis and even Oskayak, right? Mm -hmm. And when it first started, it was Native Survival School. And um, I think that is what I would describe as indigenous education. When you mix language, land, and culture, as well as, the, as that, that other piece, which is English and history and math and stuff like that. It's because we got to remember when we got taught when 400, 500 years ago, even 300 years ago, it was, it was our elders teaching us the history and the math and the, and the language and the land and how to snare and how yeah. to hunt. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what indigenous education is to me, is putting culture back where it's supposed to be in the mm -hmm. forefront. Not that there's anything wrong with English and science and math, but in our culture there's English, science and math. Is that we tend to forget that we do have math in there, we do have culture in there. For us, in order for us to get from here to he to the hunting grounds or the medicine grounds, we had to know how many days it was going to take us, and mm -hmm. we didn't call it days. We didn't call it. I'm not even going to use that stupid. I was going to say that stupid term, many moons thing, mm -hmm. but we knew how long it got there, so it was all in there. 
But to me, ing indigenous education, if we were going to have to say, use that, it's really just about mixing, bringing the culture and the land back into it. And the language, language, land, and culture, it's a huge thing. You can say culture is land and language, so you, all you'd have to say is culture. But I think that's an important tool when it comes to indigenous kids. And you, you go to places like when I first went to St. Francis here in Saskatoon, and it's known as the indigenous school now. And it's language. You see the culture everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved to have seen that when I was a kid. But I didn't know anything about what an, what an Indian was. I thought there was one type of Indian in the world. We were all the same. And there was only a teepee and, a, and an igloo, and that's it. And that we all had teepees around, around North America. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older, going, oh, there's three or four different types of Cree. Well, why didn't I learn that? Right? What is residential schools? What is, what, is, what is an Inuit? What's an igloo? And what are all these things? And then when I first heard what a wigwam was, what the heck's a wigwam? Then why didn't we learn any of this stuff? Yeah. And I think that's it, is that when we, when we do this, we make sure that they understand a little bit more about it. Like even to the other day, we did tobacco ties. Mm -hmm. And it's a big lesson, because it's a lesson to patience. And again, it's one of those lessons you'll never get until you get older, right? Mm -hmm. You go, ah, oh, I get it, patience. Damn it, you taught me something without even knowing. But that's part of our culture, is that indigenous people, we don't have to blurt out, this is what you're learning. We give you something and we, we tell you something it's up to you to find that out, and I think that's what we give them. Is in, in, but yeah, it's 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 a. When I looked at that question, what indigenous education is, I mean that's a that's a hard question because yeah. I've never used that word before. Right? Yeah. Because people can sit there and say indigenous education is learning about uh, learning about the Cree or learning about the Blackfoot, but it's not about that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about language, land, and culture. Sometimes yeah. doesn't specify because there's different language, land, and cultures. Mm -hmm. yeah. so when you think indigenous, it's almost like one word yeah. for for everything and not just one specific. If it was just Cree culture language, then you yeah. get a specific idea. So, you know, yeah. for that word, it's more, it's bigger to me. Yeah. You know, compared to back then, uh, looking at a paper, my, you know, I was like, what's this? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what this is. And mm -hmm. then growing up, learning, then you realize everything that's behind that word. And it can be different yeah. uh, to you. So just like Marcel has mentioned, and then just my few words of what I think that is. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> yeah. goes, you, you look at like the way we teach it, think, even to the putting teepees up, right? And what poles represent. Mm -hmm. Is that here in Saskatchewan, we had that one poster for the longest time. This is what teepee poles represent. Mm. which is, it's different from the Blackfoot, it's different from the Cree in Fort St. John. Again, there we, we just assumed that all people had the same amount of poles and they all meant the same thing, right? Yeah. And that's not the truth, right? And so I think that's a big thing, is, is that making sure that if we're going to teach some of this stuff, is make sure that we have those different people here. We're on Cree territory, and with, in, the, in the treaty that we're on is that we understand that, and and, and, and of course, the Métis homeland. And so making people understand what treaty you're on. Even that, right, is that yeah. I'd, it'd be interesting to go walk up and down the city of Saskatoon right now and ask that one question. What treaty land are you on? Mm -hmm. And see how many people can answer. And see, are you on Treaty 4? Are you on Treaty 6? And, um, but it'd be an interesting, interesting little, just stand in the middle what treaty land are you on? Yeah. Go, oh, I don't know. Yeah. That would make a good YouTube video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is your vision for the future of Indigenous education in, in, your community, in your community and in Canada? I think Jennifer said it well dude, just a few minutes ago. I said, yeah. something like this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Going back to the simple way of teaching, right? And I'm going to, I'm going to use St. Edward's School as an example. Um, a friend of mine um, who teaches there, Mel, he does an eco-class there where he teaches these kids all year round and they sit on couches and they all talk. And I think and that's the same thing we've been doing since 1999, right, is that we don't put them behind desks, we, we sit them down, we have all these different people coming to talk to them, mm -hmm. but we let them think for themselves. We let them use their voice because for too long they've been not using their voice, right? Mm -hmm. and they've been told, shut up, you're too young to talk, shut up. No, talk. Raise a little hell. Say no to me if you want. 
but tell me why you're not you're you're not going to do it right. Just don't say no. Mm-hmm. We're going to give you the space, and I think that's I think to me I think when it comes to the circle voices and just my part, it's just keep going where we're going because we're doing it the right way. Yeah. It's lasted a long way. It it's good to keep changing it up mm-hmm. with the the coordinators, of course, and also the different directors and the different um, playwrights and everything. That really helps because it brings a different story. But I think that culture, the language, because we're learning about lo- a lot of language now, it's fun trying to say some of these Cree words that I don't even know how to say. Them. And um, so I'm learning in the same breath. But I think the way this is, and the way Indigenous education, I hope that everybody looks at what St. Francis... Oskayak, I think, has got to find itself again. I think it's lost itself a little, no, no disrespect to them. But... But I think what St. Francis is doing and what some First Nations in Saskatchewan are doing, and you look at Belinda Daniels who does the language camp every year. An amazing, amazing language camp. Bringing it back to the land Mm -hmm. is a big, big thing. Is that remembering that we we are this land. We are these people. So it it would be great for us to do stuff outside. It would be great, but it's plus, minus 30 right now. There's Mm -hmm. no way to go outside. And we'd probably lose so many kids then. And, but I think remembering that is keep going the way we're doing, keep the culture in it. I'm glad that we've always had the culture in it. And I think that if we would take the culture out of Circle of Voices, it wouldn't be Circle of Voices anymore. I don't think we would have lasted as long yeah. without that culture. Because they learn things, right? They learn something about themselves. Mm-hmm. Even though they, some of them hate smudging, and some of them hate going to sweat, and whether we do pipe ceremonies or not, and we do the horse dance, yeah. And it's, but they learn something from it, because all of us, as young people, we hated going to cultural stuff. We hated going places unless mm-hmm. it was a powwow and we can be with 20, 30 friends and just running around. But it's that patience, and it's it's an amazing thing to learn. It's it's still it made me smile, and I know we talked about it before. It made me smile, and hurt me too in the same breath when I heard a kid go, "I don't care about my culture, and I don't mm-hmm. want to learn about my culture." But that's partly all our faults, right? Because of what, because we forgot about it. Mm-hmm. I didn't care about it when I was 15, 16 too. I didn't want to learn. I didn't know what I was. I knew people didn't like me. I didn't, they didn't like me because I was Métis or half-breed. White people didn't like me because I was Indian. So I'm going, okay, leave me alone. And so I can understand where it comes from. But just to hear that it's still there like that, it kind of freaked me out. I'm going, wow, kids are still hating their culture. Like, how do we bring them back in? And I think this program brings them back in. And it brings them back in softly. And because we're non judgmental, we're not going to laugh if you don't know your language. We're not going to laugh if you don't know how to smudge. Mm -hmm. We're going to tell you, just put your hands up. We're not going to laugh if you don't do do it right. We give you the answers that that help guide you to do it yourself. Because we're not just like going to a school and like, we'll take these five kids and yeah. bring them here. Yeah. You know, this is by their own free will. You know, they find mm-hmm. like, why do they want to take the program? What do they want to get out of it? Yeah. So, you know, that is other the softer way of doing it. It's mm-hmm. because they're they're coming to us. So we're not, you know, like for you know grabbing people and just forcing them to, no. to do it. So I think that's also I- an important thing to add into the education system oh, yeah. is giving them that option and it really depends to like all schools universities it's different so what are they missing well what do you have and then what what's important and what is missing about it so mm-hmm. is it a program like this at a university what you know like and we have come along a way and I can't speak too much uh, because it has been a while since I've been in uh, elementary and high school but I can certainly see the difference from then to now to not having anything about the indigenous and only learning it once I did this program mm-hmm. so the only thing cultural thing we had during that that time was jigging club heritage mm-hmm. dancers yeah. and that was about it but there was we just started learning dance that we weren't even getting taught on some of the teachings yeah. so it was kind of you know like non like it was a fun experience but there was a lot that you weren't learning mm-hmm. from it so what program do you have how can you strengthen it? Yeah. How can you 
expand it or asking the students what's missing because we do evaluations what would mm -hmm. you like to see more so that we can you know build on that for the next program mm -hmm. you know asking the students themselves and even in high school there was so very very little like a handful of us indigenous students and the only thing that we had was the Cree classes mm -hmm. and even then I didn't get a lot out of those because we copied words off the board and okay. drew, drew a teepee yeah. and so I didn't really get a lot so I think there's you know lost opportunities and things that we could do to strengthen that mm -hmm. and again like the only way to do something like this was to apply to this after-school program. But now I've seen that they've really embraced it, the Indigenous culture at, at the schools. But again, what are what how many things are they bringing to that school? What are the other schools missing? Because some of them don't have the capacity to, to have that. So mm -hmm. sometimes we'll get requests for us to come to them because they can't afford to hold a whole year class on yeah. that or anything. It's only for little things like this. So... I think, like, you can't really speak for one school, but for all that has, you know, many different types of people, what's there, how can you improve it, or what can we add? Can you think of any types of information that if you had now, it would help to achieve your vision? I think the biggest thing about this, this whole Indigenous education, even still for voices, it's always about the people mm -hmm. that work it. It's that trust. We trust each other. We know each other. We know what job we're doing. We know what the Soko Voices is and what it, it what it isn't. And so it's not like we're coming in and re remolding everything. It gets remolded because of the youth that come in. Mm -hmm. And but it's that trust of the elder and the trust of the coordinator and the AD and the GM who know that we can nicely go over the waves and everything and guide this into what it's supposed to be at the end of March. I don't think there's a magic, there's no magic pill or magic bullet for the circle of voices, but what it is, is, is the youth. It's, it's making sure that we're honest all the time about what we're doing. And, th and that's a big thing is that, because we're not trying to make superstars and, oh, we are trying to make superstars, but not in the sense of now you're going to become these big actors and these big things, yeah. right? What we're just trying to do is make them shine, and I think that's the biggest thing that we have to we have to stay true to is that it's not about me, it's not about Jennifer. They're going to make us look good no matter what, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when the when the play is over and people people come up to us and thank you and say you guys did a good job, it'll it'll feel good, but it's really got nothing to do with us. We were in the back. It's them doing the play, and whoever the playwright is and the director, we were we came along for the ride. And I, I'd like getting that pat on the back too, but making sure that it's not about me, it's about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and I think to keep, keep rolling along with the same kind of idea. Again, it's changed again from the beginning, and, and it's going, it's going to change again probably now and then. But, but it's, it's really trying to keep to the same standard that we're doing, because Circle of Voices is, is an amazing program, mm -hmm. and, and we've. I think one one year we went over to sixty f different touring places, wow. to the little little of four or five only touring places. But we've been all over Canada. Mm -hmm. People know about it, and people talk about this program, right? And people love this program. So, I think maintaining what it's supposed to be at. I think it's always been an honest program, and I think that's the thing: is keep it honest because we've tried not to make it too colorful and too this, right? Mm -hmm. It's still it's 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 still it's 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 young still self right after even 17 18 years it's still a it's still an early program that's still doing what it's supposed to be doing mm -hmm. we're not trying to change it up we're not trying to make it this big big thing it's still something it's almost like a thing that's still in the background but it's in the foreground a lot aside from the programs in which you are personally involved what information do you have on other indigenous education programs are you talking about within our company or with Within, within, places. Can, within Canada. Canada? Yeah. The ones that I know of, like even the Bath, Banff Center, yeah. Art Center, is, mm -hmm. is an amazing, amazing program. I hear nothing good about good things about that program. And, and I think when that first started, it's brought in a lot of amazing, amazing younger people and older people, right? There's even elders that go take classes there about writing and acting and directing and whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that's an amazing program. The newly started one of the ATP program oh, over at the university. That's right. That is, 
that I have to say is probably one of the best things that started at the university was the ATP program and this, they're getting a lot of young kids some kids that used to be here mm -hmm. that are in it now but I think again but, but it's because they mix culture in it right yeah and, and it's their stories and I think that's the other thing right down the line from the beginning in 1999 it's their stories it's not our stories but yet each one of us probably have something in there that's kind of our story but it's their stories mm -hmm. I think anything that has to do with being indigenous or, or and 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 in indigenous education it's we're allowed to tell our stories it's not somebody doing black robe and dances this world part seven yeah. or other stories that sh sure about us but it's not our story because we never told it here they get to tell their stories and there they get to tell their stories and I think that's what it's important you look at the that program in, in Banff and you look at Native Earth and Talking Stick and a few other programs across Canada and you even look at St. Francis and things that happen at Ruskayak is that it's always in the end it's about them and the youth and their story and that's big because again we've been we've been told for so long what our story is is that we're finally telling no this is our story and that's screwing people up because I'm going what we didn't know about that we didn't know about that we didn't know about certain things when I I'm 49 and I still look back and go holy crap I didn't know about that how did I not know about that because I was never part of their story to tell my story their story the story that I was brought up with is let's get him rid of that part of the story so we can bring him up to be I'm going to say it, to be just like us, whatever that means. That old beautiful colonialism thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the programs like different are like starting to grow out there, not all doing the, the same thing, no. and they can only have the capacity to like focus on a section. Like mm -hmm. another one we just uh, re it happened in the past and it's come back now is the Indigenous Playwright Circle. Right. And that really highlights, you know, because we need more, you know, Indigenous storytellers telling their stories on stage. Mm -hmm. and you know, it's, we're lucky to have it here in town because we have a lot of voices. And to have this tool to specifically work on that section of themselves is really great. Mm -hmm. I mean, COE covers a lot of spots, but if you want things that, like, really focus or, like, more intense, you got, yeah, places like the APP, Indigenous Playwrights Circle, and there's other... You look at even the poets, right? Yeah. With Kevin Wiesekate and, and Lindsay, Lindsay Knight and um, Janelle. The, you have the Poets Society, the Indigenous Poets Society. That's amazing because it's telling their story. Stories that when you go listen to some of the poetry, you kind of go, Ugh, and you go, oh my God. And, and a lot of people, and I'm going to say non-Aboriginal people, will probably look and go, oh my God, why am I feeling this, right? Why am I feeling this? I've never heard this story before. Because we finally get to tell our story, mm -hmm. and you're going to li listen to us. You don't have to, but I think that's the biggest thing. You look at things like that, you can tell the change is happening. And it's a part of education again. It's educating us, mm -hmm. but it's also education everybody else around us. Because yeah. some again, we we have tons of indigenous people that still don't know a lot about their culture and a lot about things that are going on around them. It's amazing. Like even the other day, a friend of mine was talking to me, and he he for the first time saw the number of how many missing murdered women in Canada, and he said, "I didn't know that number." And I said, "Yeah, but the number's probably bigger." I said, don't take the RCMP and Canadian, Canadian government's number as truth. Mm -hmm. That number's probably bigger than we both all know. But it's, but it's amazing that we're all educating each other. And in some cases, we have to get rid of the lateral violence that we teach each other sometimes, but that's just me. But it's, it's great to see some of these programs happening and, and these pe people changing their mind. Because there's still a lot of pushback. You look at last year, was it last year when one of the schools got mad about smudging? Oh, really? in, in town and, and I remember 10 years ago when they were complaining about smudging mm -hmm. and then we had this whole sit down and talk and okay it's okay but I think the problem is is that everybody thinks we force people to smudge nobody forces anybody mm -hmm. to smudge that's one thing we, do, we don't do mm -hmm. we don't go you need to smudge you can walk past it it's like one of the girls the other day asked about smoking pipe mm -hmm. and I said well, you don't have to you don't have to smoke it and then she also said well I don't want to get high so it's that assumption mm -hmm. in those jokes that people have made that, yeah, we put marijuana into our, our, our pipe. And I'm going, no, there's nothing high in there. And I said, but you don't have to smoke it. You touch it to your shoulder and pass it on by. And she said, really? And I said, yeah. But without judging her and without laughing at her, mm -hmm. I did tell her, let her know that, yeah, it's, I said, it's not getting high. And I said, that's the thing you need to change. Is that don't, don't say that. If you do say that in public, I said, 
I hope you're not around mean people. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, just be, be glad you're around me. But I think that's, it's changing and it's, it's evolving. There's a lot of anger out there. And you can see that in a lot of our plays. You can see that in our drama. You can see that in our writing, in our poetry. But I understand why. Mm -hmm. Because for the longest time, people like Jennifer and I weren't supposed to have a voice. We were supposed to sit back and go along for the ride. But s something woke us up, and somebody woke us up, and here we get to raise a little heck, right? And mm -hmm. like her play last year and my play the year before, we made sure we, we, sh we shook it up a little. But that's our job. And that's our job to teach young people to shake it up a little.